Welcome to another episode of Mormon Sunday School. I'm your host, Bill Real. Grateful for the chance to be with you today. Let's jump right into it. This uh, week, we are in Chapter 5 of the Gospel Principles Manual. The uh, topic is the creation. And when we turn to the old manual from 1979, as well as the new manual, there are no real significant differences from the old manual to the modern one. And so we won't spend a whole lot of time there, but we will talk about some of the doctrine or the faithful uh, sort of theology behind the creation. And so first, we just want to note from lessons prior to this chapter that we've talked about, hey, we have a heavenly father, that each of us are spirit children of God, that there was a plan presented in the premortal existence, and Jesus Christ came forward and volunteered to be the savior of mankind. We needed a place to go to, to take on our mortal probation. And so God needed to create a planet for us to inhabit. And he sent Jesus Christ. It's Christ who created the planet Earth for us. For believing Mormons, when they go to the temple and take out their endowment, they are presented a story about how Christ created this world for us. And it goes into sort of the same storyline from Genesis. Uh, in terms of how that creation was carried out, such as dividing the, the, the smaller nighttime light from the larger daytime light, um, s- separating the land from the water, uh, those kinds of things. And so it was Christ who carried out the creation. Uh, I just want to note that in Genesis, there are two different uh, creation stories, and that Mormonism... Uh, takes that in and envelops that within its theology by saying that all things were created spiritually before they were created temporally. And so I would want to note that. Uh, Adam and Eve, so uh, so the uh, night from day was created, land from the water was separated, all kinds of vegetation placed on the planet, all kinds of animal life placed on the planet. But the greatest creation of all was God placing Adam and Eve in the garden and breathing the breath of life into them. The creations show God's love. When we look at the beautiful scenery of this planet, it uh, notes how much God loves us. So, uh, for instance, I'd been to Niagara Falls, and I think that that is one of the most gorgeous things on the planet, to sit and watch this gigantic natural waterfall that... uh, what, whoever the creator is, again, Heavenly Father, he made a beautiful planet for us to inhabit if we will just pause for a moment and take in such beautiful scenery. So I'd like to spend a moment sharing with you a few quotes. There's this idea that Adam and Eve in being created, that Eve was taken from the rib of Adam, and that these stories are literal uh, in the complete sense of the word. But that's not what LDS prophets, uh, seers, and revelators have taught. And so I just want to show you a few quotes. Here's Spencer W. Kimball. Uh, He said, the story of the rib, of course, is figurative. And that was in the Blessings and Responsibilities of Womanhood, Enzyme, March 1976. The uh, next one, Bruce R. McConkie said, she was placed on earth in the same manner as was Adam. The Mosaic account of the Lord creating her from Adam's rib being merely figurative. So Bruce R. McConkie also agreed that this is a figurative telling. And then these ones are really interesting from President Brigham Young. Moses made the Bible to say that Adam's wife was taken out of his side, was made of one of his ribs. I do not know anything to the contrary of my ribs being equal on both sides. The Lord knows if I lost a rib for each wife I have, I should have none left long ago. He said, you believe Adam was made of the dust of this earth. This I do not believe, though it is supposed that it is so written in the Bible, but it is not to my understanding. I do not believe that portion of the Bible as the Christian world do. I never did, and I never want to. What is the reason I do not? Because I have come to understanding and banished from my mind all the baby stories my mother taught me when I was a child. I just want to acknowledge that in LDS theology, there is plenty of room given 
to not have to believe all of the narrative as literal. And that it really is up to people, such as Brigham Young taking it upon himself to not believe these stories in the Bible that seem absurd, that seem imaginative, that, that seem to be anything other than possibly a literal story. And so you as a believer need to sense that you have some safety, you have some room to not see these stories as literal. Um, at what point do you decide what's literal and what isn't? Completely up to you, I guess. But I would suggest that there should be, as Brigham Young said, there should be some degree of critical thinking, some degree of rational thinking that takes place that allows you to push back against the narratives that have been handed down to you that don't make any reasonable sense. And Eve being made from one of Adam's ribs and him being made out of the clay doesn't make rational sense. And Brigham Young and lots of other Latter-day Saints have chosen to take the liberty of not believing those stories literally. So I would say again, we're, we would end here with the creation show God's love. Um, that there's beautiful scenes on this planet. There's beautiful scenery. Uh, if we just be present and take a lot of pauses, maybe we're on a hike in nature. Maybe we're on a trip to see some incredible uh, piece of the planet. But we should take the time to observe the planet and appreciate how beautiful it is uh, and how uh, how interested the creator would be in us to create a planet so beautiful. And I, I just want to end by noting a little bit of doctrine behind the creation. Again, Heavenly Father, he's in charge. He lives on a planet near a star named Kolob. We get that from the book of Abraham. There is a lot of uh, astronomy in LDS theology that is taken from the book of Abraham, namely from facsimile number two on the Egyptian papyri. That is going to become, we'll, we'll get into it, I'm sure, at some point later on in the manual, but the book of Abraham is an issue that is deeply problematic for a lot of folks trying to have faith in the church, and we'll speak on just a little bit of that in a moment. But there is a lot of astronomy given in the book of Abraham about how the planets in the universe work and which ones have influence on uh, our, our galaxy and our planet. I want to note that, uh, that Michael is Adam and Jesus is uh, Jehovah, or Jehovah is Jesus. So the pre-mortal Jesus is Jehovah, the pre-mortal Adam is Michael. And what we learn in the endowment is not only did Jehovah create planet Earth, but he was assisted by others, namely uh, Michael or Adam. And so we want to note that. And then some of the things that are obscured that we don't really get into that I wanted to make sure we did in this lesson, we talked about how Michael is portrayed as under Christ in the endowment, while early Mormonism places Michael as Heavenly Father, meaning that he would be higher in authority than Jesus Christ. And so there is this discrepancy that occurs in Mormonism that we all uh, would need to wrestle with a little bit and sort of sense if Brigham Young was so sure that Adam was our heavenly father and the modern church is so sure that he isn't, we might need to wrestle a little bit with what it means to be a prophet and whether prophets uh, are able to truly discern what is true and what isn't and if they are not, at what point do we get to insert our own intuition and our own conscience about what is right and wrong or what is true and false? And then I want to note that Abraham's astrology is based at least in part on one of the facsimiles on the Egyptian papyri that the Book of Abraham translation allegedly came from. And the, the trouble here is that in the context of Mormonism, the Book of Abraham is a scriptural work that includes facsimile too, in Egyptian uh, hypocephalus. However, Egyptologists have examined facsimile too and concluded that its interpretations in the Book of Abraham 
do not align with their understanding of ancient Egyptian beliefs. In other words, facsimile number two in the Egyptian papyri is claimed by Joseph Smith to mean various things about God and God's theology. But when Egyptologists translate facsimile two, it has absolutely nothing to do with Christianity, with Heavenly Father, and with any of the other things that are attributed to it by Joseph Smith. The primary issue is that the symbols and figures in facsimile 2 do not correspond to the narrative presented in the Book of Abraham. In other words, the translation provided in the Book of Abraham does not match the scholarly interpretation of the Egyptian imagery. This discrepancy has led to concerns among some Mormons who are studying the Book of Abraham and its relationship to Egyptology. It raises questions about the authenticity of the translation and the challenges of the traditional understanding of the Book of Abraham as a literal translation of an Egyptian document. Remember, Joseph Smith is the one who said when he translates, when he dictates the translation, that this that these are the writings of Abraham written by his own hand. And what the LDS Church does today in the Gospel Topic essay on the book of Abraham is uh, indicate that the papyri, rather than being the writings of Abraham written by his own hand, may have actually been a catalyst that led to Joseph Smith being able to receive the book of Abraham from God, that it was never on the papyri. But then that raises questions about why God would allow Joseph to misunderstand the document and almost to a degree to where there seems like God is being a little bit deceptive to the point where Joseph Smith misappropriates meaning to facsimile to that isn't there. I just want to note here are some other uh, replicas, not replicas, that's the wrong word. These are other uh, similar hypocephaluses that exist out there in the world. Uh, here is one. Uh, here is another one. I just want to note here what is being circled if we if we look at what the book of Abraham proposes about the hypocephalus, it claims that this figure that the yellow circle is near, that figure who's upside down sitting on a chair, that that is heavenly father, but in Egyptian that is the god Min, in Min is always represented as a sexual god with uh, his penis being erect, and that's what I have circled in the yellow. And so in, e in Egyptology, in, in Egyptian, this hypocephalus means a set of things. And this particular piece of the image is men who has an erect penis. In Mormonism, Joseph Smith took this hypocephalus to and said that this was God sitting upon his throne. And I just want to note that uh, in Mormonism, in the 1902 Pearl of Great Price, uh, men's penis was removed. And in the 1921 Pearl of Great Price, it was removed as well, which means that the church understood that it was a penis. It sort of had some embarrassment about Heavenly Father on his throne having a penis, and they thought the best way to deal with that was to remove the penis from men and to publish the hypocephalus II without the uh, image being as it was originally. And so, folks, that is Chapter 5 of the Creation, and I'm super grateful that each of you joined us today. I'm really excited about next week when we're going to talk about the fall. I think there are some really cool ideas uh, within that, and so I look forward to seeing you next week. This has been another episode of Mormon Sunday School. Gospel Principles, Chapter 5, The Creation. Have a great week, everyone.